Welcome back to the Tabernacle of Moses, written by Kevin J. Connor. We are on the brazen altar. Now, the brazen altar is going to be cut up into two sections because it's fairly long. Um, and so just look for one is going to be called A, the number, and A, and then the, no, the next one will be the same number and B. That makes sense. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, I highly encourage you to do so. You'd be helping me out tremendously. Let's get started. The brazen altar in general. The brazen altar is by no means the first altar mentioned in Scripture. Indeed, throughout the Old Testament, there is a progressive relation of the altar. Many of the early men of faith were men of sacrifice. We see this in the following examples. There is an altar at least implied in the first sacrifice for man's sin made by God in the Garden of Eden, Genesis 3, 21 through 24. An altar is also implied in Abel's offering at the gate of Eden, Genesis 4, 1 through 4, Hebrews 11, 4. Noah built an altar unto the Lord. This is the first specific use of the word altar, Genesis 8, 20. Abraham built an altar in connection with the covenant God gave him, Genesis 12 and verse 7. Isaac also built an altar in connection with the covenant being renewed in his ears, Genesis 26, 25. And Jacob also built an altar at the command of the Lord in Genesis 35 and verse 1. God's revelation is always progressive. All of these altars add line upon line and are forerunners of that which is to come in the brazen altar. God permitted altars to be made to him. Yet we see in scripture that he gives instructions as to what type of altar can be made. In Exodus 20, verse 24 through 26, God outlines the following. The children of Israel were permitted to build an altar of earth. This is where he recorded his name. Perhaps this was the type of altar found in the first two cases above. See also 2 Kings 5.17. They were allowed to build an altar of stone, providing that it was of unhewn stone. It was to have nothing tooled of man that would pollute it. Um, we see in Exodus 17 and verse 1 that God prescribed an altar of brass. God's altar were to have no steps. Exodus 20 and verse 26. And this brazen altar was to be no exception. It is suggested that there was a sloping ascent or ramp to this high altar because two steps were forbidden. Because the steps were forbidden. God forbade them use the use of steps because he wanted no flesh to be seen when the priest carried out his ministrations. Flesh was always characteristic of pagan feasts and ceremonies. The heathen nations round about Israel were all involved in fleshly worship to their idols. Israel was to be a people set apart. There is no place for the flesh at God's altar. And thou shalt make an altar, Exodus 27 and verse 1. As we've already indicated, there were two altars in the tabernacle, the golden altar of incense and the brazen altar. Sometimes there is confusion in Scripture as to which is being referred to in a given passage. And yet, if we remember two things in regard to the golden altar of incense, we will have no problem. First, uh, first of all, there's no blood sacrifice uh, offered on the golden altar of incense. And secondly, only the priests were allowed into the holy place wherein the golden altar was placed. Throughout the scriptures, the brazen altar is referred to in the following ways. The altar of shittim wood, the altar of burnt offerings, the brain altar, the altar of God, the altar of the table of the Lord, the altar at the door of the tabernacle. The word altar itself has primarily two meanings. It means lifted up, high, or ascending. Jesus Christ was lifted up on the cross, which was his altar. Since then, he has ascended up and is high above all. It 
also means slaughter place to the Hebrew understanding. In the Greek, it carries the thought of being a place for the slaying and burning of victims. Calvary was indeed the slaughter place. Christ was led as a lamb to the slaughter and flayed alive for us. Hence, the altar pointed to Calvary's cross, where all the brazen altar foreshadowed was fulfilled. Of Shittim wood, Exodus 27 and verse 1, the same wood that was used in the Ark of the Covenant, the table of the showbread, the altar of incense, the boards and the pillars, was to be used in the brazen altar. The same truth was related to all the other pieces of furniture that applies here. Shittim wood is white, durable, and incorruptible wood. It speaks of Christ's sinless and incorruptible humanity. He was uncorrupted by sin, Satan, or the world of fallen man. Neither did his body see corruption when it was laid in the tomb. He is the righteous branch who was cut off. His life was the only perfect life ever lived here on the earth. In the Son of Man there was sinless, deathless, and incorruptible humanity, for he was the very Son of God. Wood is an integral part of the message of Christ. He died on a wooden cross, even an, as Isaac, the only begotten son of the Old Testament, carried the wood f- carried the wood for his own typical sacrifice. Even so, Jesus carried his wooden cross upon which he was to be sacrificed. The wooden cross was his and our altar, according to Hebrews 13.10. Five cubits long and five cubits broad, the height thereof shall be three cubits, Exodus 27 and verse 1. We see two particular numbers in connection with the measurements of the brazen altar. The altar was to be three cubits high, three cubits Three is the number of the Godhead in connection with the altar, which was the instrumental, which was instrumental in providing the blood of atonement. It points out to us that the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, was involved in the three days and three nights of the atonement. And I, and uh, okay, the other prominent number in connection with the brazen altar is the number five. The brazen altar was to be five cubits long and five cubits broad. The number five is typical of the grace of God in the atonement. The brazen altar was the place of the shedding of that precious blood that brought atonement to the people, just as the cross of Calvary was the place where the precious blood of Christ was poured out for us. On the cross, Christ suffered five wounds, his feet, his hands, his side. These five wounds of Christ are... God's oh, okay. Something didn't make sense, but figured it out. These five wounds of Christ are God's answer to the five I wills of Satan when he crossed God's will in heaven. The number five is seen all throughout the tabernacle. In fact, it is the most prominent number in the whole of the tabernacle. How fitting that the number of grace should be the dominating number in the place of God's dwelling among his people. If not for the grace of God, there would be no such dwelling. Because of the prominence of this number, we offer the following summary of the number five and multiples of five throughout the tabernacle. In the court, there were 60 12 by 5 pillars, chapiters, and sockets. They were probably 120 uh, or 24 by 5 pins. The outer port court measured 100 or 20 times 5 and 50 10 times 5 uh, f- times 5 cubits. I'm not sure what that's trying to say there. If the pillars were evenly placed, there were five square cubits of linen upheld by each pillar. In the tabernacle, there was a total of 100 sockets of silver. There was a t- there were 15 bars passing through the boards. There were 10 linen curtains. There were 50 tatches of gold in the curtains. There were 50 tatches of brass in the goat's hair curtain. There was a total of 100 loops of blue. 
the whole structure measured 30 by 10 by 10 cubits, which was a total of 3,000 square cubits. The holy place measured 20 by 10 by 10 cubits, which equals about which equals 2,000 square cubits. The most holy place measured 10 by 10 by 10 cubits, which equals 1,000 square cubits. In the entrance, the outer court gate was 20 by 5 which cubits, which was equal to a linen area of 100 square cubits. The door to the holy place was 10 by 10, giving it an area of 100 square cubits. The pillars for the door was were five in number. The veil before the holiest of all was also 10 by 10 cubits, making it also 100 square cubits. The grace of God is stamped throughout this structure. Even in regard to the two tables of the law found in the Ark of the Covenant, we see grace. For there were 10 commandments on these two t tables of stone. The altar shall be four square. Exodus 27 and verse 1. The thought of the four squareness is not new to the brazen altar. We have seen the golden altar was four square. The most holy place was four square. The veil was four square. And the door was four square. The breastplate of the high priest was four square. And the court could be equally divided into four squares. The number four points us to the fact that this message of atonement is worldwide. The gospel is to be preached to the four corners of the earth. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to all who would believe. The gospel is for all. In spite of this emphasis of the four squareness, we cannot help but remember that the furniture, yes, even the very camp, was ordered in the form of a cross. In this, we have a double type. The four Gospels point us first to the cross. Once we have experienced the cross, we are directed last to the four square city of God in the book of Revelation. Uh, chapters 21 and 22. The only way into the four square city of God is through the cross. And thou shalt make the horns of it upon the four corners of the earth, or upon the four corners thereof. His th horns shall be of the same. Exodus 27 and verse 2. There were to be four horns on the brazen altar. Here we find another link between the golden altar and the brazen altar. The horns we have already seen are always typical of the power and strength of the animal. Horns speak of salvation, strength, and power, which is to go into all the world to every creature. Throughout the scriptures, the horn is seen in connection with some important events. Note the following. The ram of substitution was caught in the thicket by its horns. Israel blew ram's horns at the fall of Jericho. Christ is seen as a lamb with seven horns. There are horns on the symbolic beast kingdoms. The horn was used in the anointing of kings. In connection with the brazen altar, the, horns has, the horn has added significance. First of all, they were a functional adornment. It was on these horns that the sacrificial animals were tied. The sacrifices of the Old Testament were unwilling sacrifices, but Jesus Christ came as our New Testament once and for all sacrifice. He was a willing sacrifice that did not have to be tied. He was only bound by a love to do his father's will. No one took his life, but he laid it down at Calvary's altar. Another interesting and highly symbolic event took place in connection with these horns. In Exodus 21, 14, we are told that the horns of the altar were to be a place of refuge. In this respect, it speaks to us of the cross, which is our only place of refuge. In at least two cases in the Old Testament, we see that men fled to the altar to, in obedience to this scripture. In each case, we have quite a different result. In a time of rebellion, Adoniah, 
who was caught in his sin fled to the horns of the altar, seeking a place of refuge for, from the judgment of the king. Solomon showed mercy and gave him a chance to prove himself. In another case, when Joab rebelled and fled to the horns of the altar, he received no mercy. To one man, the altar meant life. To another, the same altar meant death. We see this points to the message of the cross so vividly portrayed in the two thieves. The gospel is a savior of life unto life or death unto death. To those that are perishing, it is foolishness, but to those that are being saved, it is the power and wisdom of God. The primary message of the brazen altar is the message of the cross. The horns of the altar are those which were touched by the blood on the Day of Atonement. In this regard, four horns point us to the four central truths involved in the cross and the atonement. The four horns speak of redemption, ransom, substitution, and reconciliation. And thou shalt overlay it with brass, Exodus 27 and verse 2. The brazen altar was to be overlaid with brass. This brass was no doubt taken from the offerings which were brought before the Lord to build the tabernacle. Throughout the scripture, brass is generally seen in connection with evil, evil men or judgment upon sin. Brass is the symbol of the strength and judgment against sin. In the tabernacle, brass is particularly characteristic of the outer court and its furniture. Brass is seen in connection with the following, the 50 tatches on the goat's hair curtain, uh, the five sockets for the tabernacle door, the pillars, the pins, the sockets in the outer court, the brazen altar, and the brazen laver. All were of brass or copper, as some translate. It was the outer court in which sin was to be judged. There was the sacrificial cleansing by the blood of the animal sacrifice, and there were the ceremonial washings to wash away all defilement, brass, clearly speaks of this judgment of sin. In Deuteronomy, we find one of God's promises to his people was that if they were disobedient, the heaven would be as brass over their heads. In other words, there would be their communication with God would be cut off. And worse than that, the heavens, which are a place of God's throne, would be characterized with judgment against the sin and disobedience and a broken law. To the obedient, God's throne is a throne of mercy, but the disobedience transforms it into a seat of judgment. There is another clear example in the Old Testament which illustrates this thought of brass being associated with judgment. When Israel murmured against God, who had just delivered the enemies into their hands, God sent serpents to judge them for their sin. The serpents had venomous bite, which was deadly. The people soon came to repentance, and God provided a means whereby, through the exercise of faith the people might be healed. Moses was to lift up the serpent of brass upon a pole. As the people looked upon the serpent of brass, they were healed from the judgment of sin and the fiery brazen serpents which bit them. All of this speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ, who became that one who was lifted up on a pole, the cross and judged for our sins. He even prophesied, as Moses lifted up the serpent, the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. At Calvary, Jesus fulfilled all of this. He was judged for our sins. He judged Satan, the serpent, and with all sin, sickness, and death. He took upon himself the punishment of all, for the wages of sin is death. Sin must be punished or judged, and by God's own word it must be dealt with. It must be death. The penalty for sin is death. So Christ was made sin for us. He became a curse for us. He was judged for us when he was lifted up as a serpent on a pole. As we look uh, 
upon the entire tabernacle as a picture of Christ, the brazen altar speaks of the feet of Christ. Jesus Christ was the man whose appearance was like the appearance of brass. Ezekiel 40 and verse 3, his feet were like unto brass burning in a furnace. As we come to Christ by the wooing of the Spirit of God, we must begin here at the feet of Christ. We must experience all the brass of the brazen altar typifies. The brazen altar was overlaid within and without with brass. We saw this in connection with the Ark of the Covenant. When this was accomplished, a cross-section of the altar would reveal three layers. There would be three layers in one altar. And the truth here is evident. Brass within is symbolic of the Holy Spirit who dwells within. It is his ministry as the spirit of, the, of judgment to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Wood in the midst reminds us of the wooden cross upon which the central one of the Godhead, the Son, was judged for us. Brass without points us to the Father who is judge of all. He judged his Son for the sin, for our sin and sins. The number three points to us to the Godhead. The Godhead was involved in what took place on Calvary. The number one reminds us that there is only one cross, one sacrifice, one atonement, and one Savior, one way, and once and for all sacrifice for sin. In the tabernacle we have, therefore, but one altar of sacrifice. And thou shalt make his pans to receive his ashes, and his shovels, and his basins, and his flesh hooks, and his fire pans. All the vessels thereof shall thou shalt make of brass." Again, we see the number five in connection with this altar. There were five vessels of ministry used in connection with this altar. These include the following. The pans. The pans were used to carry forth ashes to clean a uh, place outside the camp. Ashes were also to be used in purification. The shovels. The shovels were used in, to pick up the ashes, and for tending the fires. The basins, or the bowls, were used to pour the blood at the altar for the sprinkling of the blood. The flesh hooks were used to arrange the sacrifices on the altar. They were to put the sacrifice in order that it would be perfectly consumed. And then the fire pans, or the censers, were used to carry the coals of fire from the basin altar to the golden altar. It was on the basis of the coals of the brazen altar that the incense was caused to ascend unto God. There are vessels referred to by Isaiah who said, Be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. All these vessels were to be constructed out of brass. They point to the, belie the believer to the believer priest who is to be standing in the blood of Christ as a pure vessel before the Lord. The five vessels point also to the fivefold ministry. In Ephesians 4.11, uh, which are again typified in Aaron and his four sons. Five is also seen in the number of Le Levitical offerings that were burnt on the altar. The burnt offering, the meal offering, the peace offering, the sin offering, and the trespass offering. All of these various five points to the grace of God. God coming out in grace to man in redeeming power. Divine grace to sinful man flows from Calvary. <coughs> and thou shalt make for it a grate of network of brass, and upon the net shall thou make even four brazen rings in the four corners thereof. And thou shalt put it under the compass of the altar, beneath that the net may be even to the most to the midst of the altar. Exodus twenty seven, four and five. The altar had a grate or a network of interwoven strands of brass which was to be positioned in the midst of the altar. This would mean that it would be placed in the central 
uh, in the center of the three cubits of the height of the altar. The grate was, therefore, one and a half cubits high. It was the same height as the table of showbread and the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat. The width of the board was also to be one and a half cubits. The spiritual significance of this connecting height has already been considered. See the table of showbread. Various diagrams show the grate of network in different positions. Some suggest that the whole of the altar was surrounded by this grate from the ground in the midpoint of the altar, or one and a half cubits high. Others show the grate in the center of the altar, on which the sacrifice was upheld with the fire beneath consumed it. Whatever the case, the chief spiritual thought is that the grate upheld the body of the sacrificial victim, and this grate was in the midst of the altar. This all pointed to the cross, which was the grate which upheld the body of Christ, the supreme sacrifice and victim for sin. Even as the grate was in the midst of the three cubits height of the altar, so also was Jesus Christ crucified between two thieves placing his cross or his grate in the midst of the three crosses. Jesus is always the one in the midst as the central figure or person of the Godhead. <coughs> this grate can be seen as the judgment seat at the tabernacle. This seat, which was one and a half cubits high, which was made accessible on the basis of the shed blood, in fact, the blood that was shed at the brazen altar on the Day of Atonement was taken to the other seat, the mercy seat, by the high priest. Judgment and mercy are linked up in these two pieces of furniture, the first and the last pieces of furniture. Wow, that's amazing. The great was to have four brazen rings in the four corners. These rings were to be instrumental in carrying not only the grate, but also the altar itself. Just as these rings were positioned, is where they were positioned is not certain. It is possible that there were slits in the four corners of the altar which would allow these rings to pass through to the outside. Whatever the case, the symbolism is not altered. These rings carry much the same message that were, was proclaimed by the four rings on the table of showbread and the four rings on the ark. They speak of the endless eternity and the eternal attributes of God. In regard to the ark and the table, we saw gold rings. These gold rings were seen in connection with the four descriptions of God in the New Testament. God is light, God is love, God is a consuming fire, and God is spirit. When these descriptions of God are associated with the four brazen rings or the four rings of judgment against sin, we note that the light, the love, the fire, and the Spirit of God purify and cleanse us. They are instrumental in judgment on our sin that we might approach the presence of God. The four rings of brass speak specifically of those eternal attributes of God that come together in his perfect judgment. They speak of mercy, truth, righteousness, and peace, which all meet together in perfect balance in the judgment of our holy God. And that's where we're going to break. So the next section will cover the second half of the brazen altar.